Um, very good. Yeah, thanks so much for offering to do this. It's, it's a real uh, pleasure to speak to you, and we're, um, we're, we're big fans of your work. Um, and um, uh, we'd love to explore your thoughts on the, the history of um, Jungian psychology and just psychology more um, broadly. Um, for, for those of us who are um, unaware of um, your work or, or Jung's work, please could you um, outline uh, your role in the creation of the, the Red Book and um, what the importance of the Red Book was for Carl Jung? Um, the Red Book is quite simply the central, um, of, central work in Jung's oeuvre. It, Fixed his self experimentation, was the, it resulted from his self experimentation from 1913 onwards. And he worked on this for about 16 years and it really contains the core of what he tried to later then convey in the next few decades um, in his scholarly writing. So it's, it shows you, in effect, you becoming you. And it actually shows you also a lot that he didn't actually cut, convey across into the writings because. I describe it as a work of psychology written in a literary and, and theological form. Uh, what I did was manage to get it released for publication. Um, I edited it and, and co-translated it. So that was my kind of role. Mm -hmm. I, I, I remember when we um, last talked, you, you talked about um, how you um, listened to um, some was it jazz music or the music of um, George uh, Gurdjieff. Um, in, in the translation of the work. How, how did the, the music have an um, impact on, on your um, uh, current translation of the book? Well, um, first I kind of, uh, I listen to music most of the day, or as much of the day as I, as I can. <laughs> um, I think maybe I'll show you my, as you come from the music, well, that's the rest of my room, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, in terms of approaching like that, in a way, let's back up a little bit. I kind of, I don't listen to music in the background, but in the foreground. And often, in a way, listening to music in the foreground and writing in the background. and. Um, music is also, if you're dealing quite simply writing history, a couple of the main things you're dealing with is how to structure things temporally and spatially, how to organize things, what sort of narrative to do, how to conceive of time structures, how to write time structures. So in that sense of spatial and temporal organization, uh, a lot of my, my thinking in, in doing history and academic work comes from the music that I kind of listen to in a way where I regard them as not as having, it's a cognitive implications for like how I think about structures, how I think about space, how about, uh, about questions of emotional landscapes. So when I was first, I first started working on Jung's Red Book in, was it 1996, um, I sat down and it was so different from what I, from the legends around it, that I stopped trying to understand it and try to sink myself into it and to enter into it. So the question is, how do I enter into this thing that seems um so far away from where i am so at the early stages the music of gurdjieff and and uh, and hartman really gave me a kind of landscape if you will uh, a sonic setting where the action is unfolding in the sense what is the mood what is the what, what accompanies the action? How do you find yourself into this landscape, not visually, but sonically? If you will, if you were kind of wanting to uh, 
film something, what soundtrack would you put to it? What and and using that as a way in. Uh, there were certain compositions by um, John Zorn that also uh, helped me kind of get into that. Um, and of course, there was uh, John Coltrane. So also dealing not just in, in terms of um, the basic landscape, i.e. in terms of background in which action unfolds, but also then understanding the structure of conflict and resolution, of dissonance, of struggle, of in musical terms of something that is um, atonal. So in a way, I, I was trying to bring to bear in a way how I think about things, how I use to kind of uh, make sense of things as a way of entering into this. So that was um, vital for me. And I did actually think when I was uh, just before the work was coming out, I thought, okay, I, I uh, did some sessions where I just put the, the images on a screen. I thought, should I use some of these tracks when I'm presenting the work? And I decided not to because I, this is my stuff. This is this is <laughs> uh, in a way. This is this is it, it's not. It's not intrinsic. It, it, it links to me, but it's to. I don't want to present this. I want to allow, as an editor or as a as a lecturer, as a presenter, allow other people to find their own entrance into something. Mm. Do you have any um, examples of like specific examples of where the, the music has um, influenced the the text? Um, in your translation, is there like um, passages in the Red Book that sort of you, you felt really connected to um, with the music and the the words? Um, I can give small uh, small examples, but they're not they don't they're not really. It's hard to think of. To, um, This one that comes to mind is there's a word that Jung uses, um, and the German is Uber Sinn. So Sinn, as in you normally translate as meaning, and Uber, you normally take it as over, or it's like a superlative. If you go literally in terms of over meaning, it's not English. Mm. Uh, you're stuck in sort of something somewhere between two languages. And um, I was working with two colleagues, uh, John Peck and Mark Kybert. So I'm not a professional translator. So they were, so for me, translation was just, uh, you know, uh, um, a massive instruction. The way this came up, well, uh, supreme meaning. Is, well, how do you get that? Well, it's, it's Coltrane, it's a love supreme. It's not just. It's the right word because it captures the the superlative dimension that you was talking about. There's not just one meaning above others, but it also in terms of what Coltrane was conveying in in a love supreme, um, for me at least, um, was pretty close to what Jung was uh, trying to convey. Um, when I was translating with again with. John Peck and Martin Liebscher this time in the Black Books, we had a what we used to call the playlist. And sometimes we were looking for, for linguistic expressions. Um, when you, you're trying to look at what works in English, what, what conveys something. And these were uh, usually song titles. So the, this was like you could say our own kind of um, running kind of in a way what how does something sound in english and that the um 
you could say they're encrypted in the text, in the text where they're really uh, lines, which are just titles of songs in the, in the translation. But I mean, that's not, um, I suppose it was serious for us. It's like trying to, one way of finding an expression that, that works and has resonance in English. That would be, the, that would be the sort of, at, at a linguistic level, um, when we were working in that way. Mm, mm. Um, I'd, I'd like to invite anyone to ask any questions, um, especially on, on Zoom as well. Time, time, do you have a question? For... Just following on from that, uh, Sonny, um, I, I'm surprised that uh, John Zorn fit the bill for that task, because from my, my experience with John Zorn, it, it's kind of a music which uh, refuses to not be listened to, and I, I can't imagine really writing to, to most of John Zorn's work. Um, so I'm wondering which which parts of his oeuvre were, were helpful to you. One particular album is it was the music he did to uh, I think a documentary on Maya Deran. Yeah, film works in the mirror of Maya Deran. Right. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, I, I wasn't listening to Zuan's Naked City. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was picturing. <laughs> So, um, <laughs> I don't think that that, sort of, uh, that that would have worked. Yeah, and then on the, the Gurdjieff music, um, I have a little bit of experience through Bennett groups and so on, where um, okay. where you have the the music set to the movements, the Gurdjieff movements as well. So I, I think of it as much of that music is tied to specific dances and specific gestures. Yeah, uh, I don't know if that. Wonder if, if you have any connection to those movements as well, or any experience with them, or if that was informing your thinking at all. Or that's interesting. No, I don't have experience of them. Yeah. I, I know of them, but I haven't had an experience of them. Yeah, it, it made me it made me wonder if there was if Jung and Gurdjieff were aware of each other in any way, or if if you're aware of any connection of that sort, since. Uh, you know, they're both heavily focused on personal transformation of some sort or other, in Jung's case with sort of alchemy and in Gurdjieff and mysticism. They were aware of each other. Um, and um, around 19, 20, 21, uh, a number of Jung's followers in London basically up sticks and to go with Gurdjieff instead and go, went out to Fontainebleau together with their patients. Um, we're just supposed to have remarked, well, now you see what happens to Jung's disciples. Um, so Jung wasn't taken by Gurdjieff in that sense, um, but there's, there's a certain context where his of interaction. So um, there was one of these figures, well, Morris Nichol was the most prominent one, and he was the main, the main advocates of Jung in London at that time. Another figure, James Young, wrote a piece called, Exper I think, An Experiment of Living, describing his experience at Fontainebleau. Uh, he then leaves after a couple of months and just goes back to Jung. And clearly, Jung he is actually getting quite a lot of information of what's going on at Gurdjieff and, and is kind of none too impressed. Right. We've got a question on the chat. Um, uh, someone asks, um, do you think music can communicate um, universal emotions um, or archetypes um, or stories? Um, what was it like to live psychologically or emotionally to live through a, a story? Sorry, it's small. Uh... A small correction of not stories, but what it's like to live through a story. So we have archetypal uh, stories, you know, that uh, repeat through history. But what if music is is not the story itself, but what it feels like um, to live through a through an event or or a story? Yeah, I mean, to the, to the... To the first question, can it communicate um, uni universal emotions? Uh, 
I don't know if you are familiar with uh, what's called the Sapphire Wolf uh, theory of linguistic relativity. Um, basically, arguing that for a strong thesis about how language structures the world. So, I mean, classic examples in, in Wolf are like uh, Eskimos apparently have 20 different words for snow. They're able to perceive. 20 different types of snow. For us, we just see snow. And the question that interests me just as an I just as a listener, so I have no professional um, um, expertise in this at all, is I like to think not in terms of having the necessary being an emotion that is then expressed through music, but the question of what is, to what extent does music give language that enables one to stroke, art, articulate, stroke, feel something? To take just an example as a, uh, I mean, I'm someone I, I, that when I'm not listening to music, there's music running in what um, Carla Blay once called the inner jukebox the whole time. So I wake up and I'll hear a track. Um, and the question is, I'm wondering well, why am I why am I hearing that? And so an example would be if you take a track like Duke Ellington's Mood Indigo. My question would be, well, did one really know what a mood indigo was before Ellington composed it? The, in a way, not just that he's writing something that is, you could say, articulates and represents something one already knows or feels or recognizes. But actually gives rise to you're able then to increase you could say your emotional registers to experience a mood in a mood indigo so in a, in a way not just that there are a set of universal emotions and there's music then that is expressing that but the question of how music is as i see it in that sense increasing our emotional repertoire our capacity to feel certain things. I don't know if that if that um, makes sense to you. Completely, oh, yeah. It's, it's sort of like um, I've heard um, uh, Samuel Andreev, who's a, a contemporary composer, sort of say that um, like going to a concert is sort sort of like going to um, to to a zoo, where you're sort of um, looking at animals behind the the glass. But in, in in the case of music, it's sort of like looking at emotions through a <laughs> like sort of spectating different conscious states and emotions and that kind of thing. So the second part of the question, does it um, convey what it's like to live through a story? I mean, that, I, I, I don't know, I'm not sure. Could you say a bit more what, what, what you mean by that? Um, well, I guess uh, an easy example would be somebody writes, um, the story itself is a story of betrayal, a uh, lover betrays uh, somebody, but when you write music, you don't have words, so you, but you can convey the emotion of heartbreak. And there's been many songs of heartbreak. And I was thinking maybe there's some sort of archetype uh, in musical language that, uh, yeah, I, I guess convey that kind of meaning. I and mean, that seems quite possible to me. Um, did did Young write much about music? I'm 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 not aware of his his writings on on music. Um, he you no, know, he did not write much. He did have, I would say, strong musical experience. It's it's interesting if you look more more widely in terms of philosophy. The there are very, very few philosophers. Um, Nietzsche would be one example that write about music, or that in a way that music forms part of their thinking, which it certainly does 
with Nietzsche. Mm. Uh, most philosophers, it, it's not a realm that they can grap that they can grapple with in their thought. Doesn't mean that they don't have maybe an, an intense interest or musical feeling. Um, so for Jung, you could say his main register is visual. Mm -hmm. So um, that's a language which he feels comfortable with, the language of the image. There are places where he does speak about music quite strongly, and actually I thought of one from time to time, just gathering them together. So for instance, I'd like say, okay, it's Bach that expresses the language of the archetypes. Well, he's, in, he's interested in it, but doesn't really, you could say he has it, intuitions about music, but doesn't really develop them. Mm -hmm. um, I, I remember my, my old violin teacher said to me, it was, it was a bit of a um, strange comment, but I've just sort of thought about it since. He said that he, he regards himself as a kind of alchemist of sound. And it got yeah. me thinking about um, Jung's own interest in, in alchemy. Um, and I was, I was just wondering what, what your thoughts were on, on music as a sort of um, metaphorical language, like we've just to add on to the, the question from Joel, that it can sort of be a, a metaphor for different um, conscious states, for emotions and, and different, those kind of things. Yeah. I would tend to say that Metaphor sounds a bit weak to me. I think it's stronger than that. It is the emotion. Mm. So, uh, metaphor suggests uh, a representation of something. So, one is almost in a more kind of cognitive type of language. I don't think there's that separation. Mm. Since I think it's more immediate than that. That's a really good point. I think um, Schopenhauer, just another another one of the philosophers yeah. who talks about music, he, he says that music um, for him um, is sort of the uh, art above all arts because it, it, it represents, in his um, words, the, the, the will it, itself. It, it doesn't it's, sort of... Yeah, it's, it's the language of the will, it's not representation. Mm. Schopenhauer. So it's, it's the thing itself rather than the um, a, a representation of... <laughs> Is, is so, that more accurate? Yeah. So in, a way, in that sense, it's not so much that, I mean, to be obviously, when, I mean, you'll know this far more than I do. I mean, you can play something that has associations, that has associations, that evokes certain moods that, that are evocative of that. People know how to do that. But I think at a more um, fundamental level, I think it actually just directly conveys the emotion itself and is not just suggestive of it obviously that's also possible you can play a melody and have certain associations with it or certain a certain type of harmony or a certain type of rhythm but you can also i think just do something that is great musicians and composers do that is that is far more direct that's why I say that there's a, to be um, if you say if you look at social psychology it will say or it will say or it used to say um, you know there are X basic categories of emotion or what have you but when you look at sort of emotion social psychologists look at I think that how I just think about things in my own life I, I, I increase the palette in a way that I put uh, musicians and composers in that in terms of what, what I, as part of the spectrum of what I associate certain types of mood certain types of associate certain types of emotions that could only be conveyed say with like okay that's that's Thelonious Monk that's a monk <clears throat> emotion of, of a certain tune that conveys I can't I don't have a better word for it <clears throat> Yeah, it's, it's kind of similar. Like I, I can't put into into words 
why I like a piece of music so much. It's not something that sort of directly relates to language so easily. Like there's that phrase, um, like music speaks where words fail. Um, this this kind of thing. Is, 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 do, you, do you think that's more sort of accurate that we, we, we can't really express through um, linguistic representations what music means? Um, and that's why it's more like immediate to us. Well, I think when you're talking about where words fail, uh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a reader and of poetry and I also just write from time to time. I think that there are poets that explore the failure of language. So if you look mm. at Paul al Salat, it's precisely what he does. His language breaks up. So that, um, or uh, I have a friend who uh, in, in Geneva, Vincent Barras, who is a historian of medicine, but also a sound poet. So well, he calls Poesie Sonore. So he does produces works where there's no semantic content. Uh, where it is just simply um, sonorous compositions with in language or with 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 phonemes. Mm. Sorry. Yeah. Um, just thinking about that in terms of kind of contemporary poetry, music, art. Um, I, I wonder if you could say something about the role of beauty in that. Whether you think that is important or not. Um, we had, um, I don't know if you're aware of John Viveki, who visited, he was a visiting speaker here a while ago, but he said that he believes in the hermeneutics of beauty in the sense that the beauty, the external beauty of something does disclose that there's something true about it and that it's not, um, you know, a falsity or an, an illusion. Um, and I feel like a lot of modern art turns that on its head. Uh, and I think he's also said that we're we're in the hermeneutics of suspicion at the moment because we always assume that the external reality of something is some sort of lie that you have to be you have to be suspicious of. Um, so I wonder if you have any thoughts on that, especially the role of beauty in music and arts and whether it's important or not. Um, there's a, a great quote by Andre Breton: "Beauty will be convulsive or will not be at all." So. <laughs> Take the first part of that convulsive beauty. Uh, I think that that's in a certain sense what, in an instance, surrealism contributed in terms of it expanded what could be classed as beauty, or in the sense of, um, I take it in terms of music to was referring earlier to Coltrane, it, it, it's a question of beauty where you're cr having a, a, a composition where there is extreme dissonance being overcome, but there's in a way framed. So, um, and I, I would say that that is a type of um, complexification of beauty. Um, I'm, I'm well aware that people that um, are not tuned in will say, okay, that is just noise or that is ugliness, but that's, that's not how I listen to it. Mm. Mm. If you have experience with, with Zorn and with a lot of yeah. extreme jazz music, then yeah, you would be someone who, who is aware of that, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> I think um, Stephen Chan has raised his hand, he's got a question. Um... Hi, thank you. Um, I guess going back to what you were saying about the inadequacy of language at times, actually, uh, the, the, the example that kind of came to mind in particular was like uh, when somebody experiences like great loss or grief actually and 
there are no words actually that can come close to expressing that feeling of like losing something I guess um, and it reminded me I, I, I've just come across this a book that you I think it was co-written or it was a dialogue between uh, yourself and James Hillman called uh, Lament of the Dead um, and the subtitle was Psychology After Young's Red Book um, and I guess what, why was it because uh, I haven't read it as yet but why was it called like Psychology After Young's Red Book and was there a central thesis or were there because it's I guess uh, my understanding of it it's framed in a dialogue between yourself and James Hillman. Um, was there a central thesis or were there particular themes that uh, kind of came up um, in, in the book? Um, the, the book wasn't premeditated. So how that came about was um, someone had invited us to give to have a dialogue on Jung's Red Book it was at the Hammond Museum in, in Los Angeles. And we had um, lunch, I think, the day before and said, you know, what are we going to do? How are we going to do this? And um, he said, I ha had the thought of beginning with this notion of uh, this phrase he took from an Egyptian context of opening the mouths of the dead. Well, great, let's just begin with that. So we just began with that. That's in a way that hewed us in on the dead. And then we had a a conversation. And um, someone I know who was filming and, and is still in the course of making a film on Jung's Red Book had transcribed the, the, the dialogue. And when I read it a few months later, what struck me personally was like certain points I couldn't tell who was saying what and it was a sense of sometimes you have a dialogue and you're just rehearsing things you were known positions where I felt okay this is uh, it's leading to things I hadn't thought it was you could say a genuinely open-ended dialogue rather than just just simply restating stuff you already know and then we decided to um in a way, continue the conversation. He said, okay, if we're doing that, let's record it. Let's film it. And then for each of the sessions, we would just like jot down, okay, what, what themes should we talk about? And we just wrote down, um, you could say a dozen kind of themes, let's talk about this, this, and this, and just, and just spoke. And it's just let it kind of meander. So it was, it was, it was, you could say, a pretty spontaneous improvisation. And certain kind of themes kind of emerged out of it. And I believe it was it was actually quite um, a, because the Red Book was released in 2009, if I'm correct. And yeah. I believe James Hillman passed away in 2011. So there was only like a two year yeah. period where that book kind of came about, which seems quite extraordinary. Yeah. You said in an interview that um, you thought that um, one of the things that was sort of developmental when you uh, wanted to become a, a historian of psychology, but um, contemporary um, psychology and sort of psychotherapy was it was in a mess. Um, I'm, I'm curious why, why you thought um, it was in a mess and what, what could Jung um, offer um, to that, um, to sort of remedy that? There's a... passage in, in William James in, in 1894 where he says, okay, is there a single, have psychologists developed any single law? You think they don't even agree on the basic terms. And if you look at that context and run it in the present day, in terms of you've had this tremendous push to establish psychology as a basic natural science, there still isn't a single law that all psychologists will agree with. They say, well, what, what actually is this discipline? Already by the early 20th century, psychologists were talking about a Tower of Babel. And say, yeah. okay, it's then a fascinating movement, and, but what, what actually has it been? 
in the sense that no psychologists actually managed to achieve what they were setting out to do in terms of establish something that would be regarded as fundamental as say Newtonian physics. That's not to say they didn't do interesting things along the way. Uh, I think what's interesting in in you on this is just actually this, the range and depth of what he was trying to take on. So you could find, I think he was taking on interesting questions. You don't have to necessarily agree with with his solutions, but say actually he was he was trying to tackle important and interesting things. Mm, mm. Um, I heard um, there was a, uh, Edward Ellinger said in an interview that there are as many different schools of um, psychology that uh, as um, sort of um, psychological like personality types, like certain types were attracted to certain um, ways of, of, of dealing with um, sort of uh, uh, psychological uh, problems. Um, I, I, was, I was wondering um, if um, Jung's own practice, because he was obviously a very, very visionary, very open person, whether that attracted um, patients that were very similar in his um, personality type and whether that sort of distorted his um, way of thinking about um, psychology. Did, did that affect um, any of his um, uh, views in a way that would sort of um, di distort his, his, his thinking towards a certain conclusion? I mean, this was what so, something that Jung was trying to grapple with himself, and that's why he writes his book on psych, psychological types. He's trying to say, okay, can you actually deal with your own bias and develop a psychology that is free of bias? And that, mm. and, 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 if you will, to try to create a typology of bias, actually, so to, you're aware of your own framework, and to try to, in a way, put it in a wider context. I think that he had, I would say, a pretty wide experience. He started with him working in a psychiatric hospital for you know, a decade. Um, and was the one that was concerned about trying to understand, from that point of view of type, typology, understand the other standpoint. I, I, Aware of the situation, aware of the, that his perspective was limited and attempting to understand other ways of seeing things. I don't think you can really ask someone to do all that. <laughs> yeah, that's fair enough. Um, just to sort of tag on to um, uh, Joel's earlier question, um, he, he was asking about um, what's it like to live in a story. Um, he um, uh, when when you spoke about the, um, the the red book in some of the YouTube videos with your introduction to the red book, you talk about Jung having a sort of private um, cosmology. Um, yeah. I was wondering um, what was this um, cosmology that uh, you, you, you describe? I mean, it's precisely elaborated in the black books and red book in the sense yeah. that he created his own mythology, if you will. A framework to understand life. Mm. I think that, that that's something that in different ways each of us does that not one doesn't necessarily make it as an explicit system but you kind of like take things from various places to kind of make sense of life. You, you make your own kind of like kind of homebrew kind of personal system or their um, personal metaphysical survival kit. And what Jung is sort of suggesting is that it's actually quite valuable to kind of elaborate that and make it explicit. Mm. All while not claiming that that's, a, that's something, that that's an iterable structure that others should believe in. So he's making it's a clear distinction I draw, or, or I see Jung drawing between his own private cosmology and a separate attempt. You could say in his in his day job when he's trying to create iterable structures 
that are valid for other people as well. Mm -hmm. Did you have a question, Tony? Yeah, uh, following on from that, um, could you say a bit more about the sorts of procedures that Jung went through to create the Red Book, that these, these fantasies that he would create? It, it seems almost like sort of just dreaming while awake. It's, it's, it's extremely creative that he's trying to follow something that's not determined by his own will. Um, I almost can't imagine someone doing that today. I don't know if we're just less imaginative. Like, like he, he seems like someone who had such a creative mind, he could come up with these things anyway. I don't know if you could have some thoughts on that. I mean, the procedure is, is, as you say, he would like uh, try to engage with his fantasy in, in a waking state. Um, through starting with a fantasy and let it develop and then engage with context, situations, figures that emerged. And I think that I don't see that as being radically distinct from what a novelist does or playwright. Uh, possibly the difference in terms of what Jung is describing as his procedure is, is a not to allow it just to unfold in a specular image, but to engage himself directly with the figures. So in a way, you're writing a play where you are one of the protagonists. Mm. So I see that as like, anyway, I don't see what he's doing there is, is particularly unusual. I think it's, it's something that creative people engage with creative process or are aware of doing. Mm -hmm. Basically, not, not to create uh, an aesthetic product, but to, you could say, explore his imagination. Is that similar to someone like um, Tolkien when he was creating the Lord of the Rings, when he would sort of um, have dialogues with his characters that he would create, and there was a sort of reality to the um, the characters that he would um, that were of his own design? Um, is, is that yeah. a, is a similar thing? Yeah, Tolkien is un in certain, in, is uncannily similar. Mm. Mm. Is, there, is there any evidence of um, Jung using um, psychedelics to create the Red Book, or is it is it just purely this sort of um, reverie? Because I've, I've heard in various interviews where there's people who speculated um, whether whether that's the case. He wasn't using psychedelics. He thought, um, I mean, in his view, psychedelics give you an experience of, of the collective unconscious, but it's passive and it's um, it's far stronger if you get the you don't need those if you get there directly. So um, you, you didn't take psychedelics. Mm. Okay. Um, just uh, further furthering this point for um, this, this idea of like a sort of private cosmology for young. Um, I was wondering, just do you, do you have any thoughts on um, what the the current um, cosmology is in in our own um, time? Is is there a sort of uh, uh, how do you say the, the, there's there's um, a cosmology that everyone uh, shares, or, or do you think it's something that is more more individual in in, in Jung's case? Just crushed. I think it's a mix in the sense. Take one aspect. Um, I think something that's been going on quite sharply at a collective level is a certain notion of. Um, we have to accept kind of responsibility for um, damage being done to the planet. That in a way, we are uh, not separate from the material the natural world, the natural world that we live in, but that we cohabit. Uh, its fate depends on us, and the fate of our species depends on it and just to understand and take responsibility for that cohabitation. I think that's a massive shift in awareness that you see happening, not just at an individual level. And you don't have to 
be have a particular religious or orientation not to say okay that is something that you have to in a way get your own head around mm. Mm. so um would you would you say then that these um shifts towards a sort of collective cosmology that's sort of a, a narrative but is 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 that similar to the function of um like uh, the sort of organized religions um that um people sort of live within um, um i see it as more spontaneous than an organized religion it's like what jung says in seminars in Earth in 1923 there's with a collapse of ecclesiastical christianity there's been a rise of what he calls individual symbol formation yeah. um and on the ecological line i think he would have been quite in tune with someone like James Lovelock and his Gaia kind of hypothesis of the earth as a living coordinated organism of systems that interact and it was sort of completely up the old street. Mm. Jung said that um, organized religion protects people from a, a, a direct experience of, of, of God. Um, do you, is, is there a, a danger with sort of opening the, the floodgates to sort of religious beliefs, like every religious belief is, is valid and this kind of thing? So um, is, is there a case to be made for, for something like dogma to re restrict people from um, the, the, the dangers of religious patterns, which is, this is something we've talked about with um, people like Jonathan Pajot um, and, and other people that, who, who think that there is a case to be made for, 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 for dogma. Um, what, 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 I was wondering what your thoughts are on this. Well, Jung saw a place for that. He, he, he saw, um, he's not speaking against religious traditions. He's just, in a way, statement about individual sim symbol formation was like, with, was almost like a socio-historical comment saying this is where we're at these traditions yeah. don't don't hold and he was spending a great deal of time trying to in effect shore up christianity in terms of through psychology of symbolism and one of those ways precisely was doing that was like kind of studies of of dogma of ritual in a way tried to retrieve for protestantism what had been he felt you know so it was he felt protestant protestantism had thrown out the baby with the bathwater mm. and needed to kind of regrass something of the symbolic content um did it, it thrown over yeah um i was listening to your talk on uh, hell earlier today and i, I don't want to take us fully there <laughs> now, but, um <laughs> That, you, that quote from, was it Meister Eckhart, um, that, that man's yeah. soul, uh, the human soul is deeper than hell. It, it feels like Jung had a resonance with Eckhart's work. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so I don't know if you could, if you could say a bit more about that sentence, because um, it's, it's, it feels extremely powerful to me, I'm not sure I fully grasp it, but then also Jung's sort of way of looking at Eckhart and his influence on it. Well, I mean, that's just expressing in a, a view that you would have shared in terms of the imminence of hell. I mean, hell is not an ontologically separate place. It's um, hell, he heaven and hell over the human heart. I think it was Blake put it that way. Um, it's here. Um, and one, there was a moment that one one finds in one's life but you, you have to sort of go there and try to come out the other side mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. one of my favorite quotes from Jung is that um he's he's not writing for the happy possessors of faith but for the um for those who for whom the light has gone out for whom the mystery has faded and, and, and god is dead is is there a way um back uh to um religious faith um that 
um, is accessible through um, the psychology of religion? Is, is, there, is there a way to, like you said, he was trying to shore up Christianity. Is, for, for people who've, who've lost faith in Christianity, is there a way back to um, you know, rekindle that fire? I think that viewed historically, that has been the case. I think that the people have gone through psychotherapy of a union or, or other kinds and, and found their way back to Christianity or other religious traditions. I, I, I know of, I know of people who've done so. I don't think that's uncommon. Mm. I mean, in a certain sense, this reminds what you say reminds me of. Uh, there's a a great poem by Gilles Apollinaire called Zone, and there's a last line I'm trying to find it. Yeah, uh, it's found in English translation. I read the last line of it. Um, At home among your South Sea Guinean fetishes, Christs of another shape, another faith, subordinate Christs of uncertain hopes, Christs of another shape, of another faith. It's a certain sense of, he's saying, you've searched out or putting out a search for the exotic and in a way recognizing that what you're looking for or your own symbolism is, is that of Christianity. Mm. And you, so I've known people who have just, you could say taken that route, have gone to other cultures, searched out all sorts of traditions, you know, practice them at quite serious levels, and they realize, okay, that their own culture, and this is something Jung himself would say, their own cultural background, their own symbolism. If they're a European is often Christianity and that they found a way to engage back with with their own tradition. Mm. Yeah, sort of um, in conversations we've had with people like um, Michael Subaru, we've, we've talked about um, how um, he thinks that religion is a, is a kind of language and that um, the, 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 his first um, language that he, he could speak was was that of Christianity, and so it's sort of um, a, a language of symbols that he understands and, and, and this kind of thing um, uh, that, that, that he can refer back to. Um, we've got another question in the in, in the chat from I think it's Joel again. Um, he says, "Weird question. Um, it's also long, so I'll, I'll try and summarize it. Um, how similar?" I, I, I can see it. I can see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just could I just read it out for those um, yeah. listening. Um, so, how, how similar are dreams and um, imagination? Um, are they the um, unconscious communicating with itself? Um, so, when he when he composes, he he seems like scenes of surreal art in his mind's eye and that kind of thing. Are, are, are dreams and imagination the um, the same thing in the unconscious? Um. It depends on what sort of what framework you, you're wanting to use. So uh, I think it's to be striking in Jung's black book in his road book, he doesn't use the word unconscious, he doesn't need it, he doesn't need theoretical language. Um, he uses fantasy, he uses symbol. Um, so I would just stick with whatever language feels appropriate to you. Mm. So, yeah, doesn't think about one's creative practice in whatever ways seem supple and descriptive. So, can I just add, I, I was just curious if uh, nowadays I um, I do it other, uh, other way around, I see a mental image and then I um, compose the soundtrack to it, like for a movie yeah. uh, and what it makes me feel like. And I was wondering, am I, uh, am I communicating that way? Some kind of, uh, um, I don't know, unconscious or subconscious symbolism in the music. If I'm sort of transcribing these images into sound. It seems to me, it's, 
it seems to me that they're connected for you, which I think is great. So I've, I've just got to get something at the door to have a delivery. Sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no worries. No worries. Um, I'm just um, wondering how to um, sort, of, sort of bring things uh, full circle. Um, so we spoke of, about Nietzsche um, and, um, and and his. Uh, writings on, on on music, and he he, he regarded um, in some sense that um, art was a um, in the, in, the, in a crisis of faith. Um, art would be a suitable replacement for for religion. Um, I was wondering what sort of um, lessons can we learn from um, Jung's decision to sort of create artwork to represent his own inner life, and um, how that can um, help help people. Um, deal with a, a crisis of meaning or a crisis of faith? I mean, art is a, is a word that Jung kind of like uh, avoids. I think that's because his works he didn't regard as art because it, but it's a he had a 19th century, um, it didn't fit into a 19th century concept of art. So I think that what is important for Jung is that they were symbolic expressions and that they conveyed meaning. That they were powerful symbolic expressions. Um, and I think that, I mean, to me, the term what is art or not art is, is a non question after Dadaism. It, 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 it's, not, it's not a philosophical question that I, I find kind of interesting. The question is whether particular works, particular images are powerful or not, do they move you mm. or not? So I think that the emphasis that for Jung is like one has to, there's a healing power of the imagination um, and then one has that resource. Mm. And it, it's, uh, it's a vital resource that in his case, you, you turn to that when you've got no other option. Mm. What's that quote from, from Jung when he talks about um, the, uh, the indestructible foundations where, where, where he's um, trying to uh, find the, the, the highest experience is going to be, be um, experienced by, by, by yourself in trying to sort of um, uh, establish this um, indestructible foundation where um, you find you can't support yourself, and this uh, something else supports you. Do you what was what was what, what's, what's the what's the quote? Um, it, but, something he says in the red book in the black books. It's a sense of just in a way. What it, I mean, Nietzsche's expression would would be the, the transvaluation of values when you find yourself in a moment when your values have collapsed and things aren't what they seem and you have to just begin again from rock bottom mm. and yeah sure bothering is using creative expression was the was what you did in that context mm. so creative expression is a way to um, start again from 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 bottom up and Absolutely. trying to get yeah, all these symbols together. Um, yeah. I wonder, just as as, as, as musicians and, and, and artists, if um, uh, perhaps if you have any advice for people who are struggling for um, how do you say try, trying to create things themselves, and, and um, if if you have any advice for um, people to how to go about that creative process. Um, I mean, I've got no experience of the creative process in music, and me, I'm just a listener. But so mm. I hear, hear music the whole time, but it's like, it's recognizable music. I don't hear new things. I hear new lines, so that I don't hear lines and I write poems where I think, okay, that uh, doesn't, doesn't sound familiar. It's like an image or something suggests itself, and better go and track that down and write something. Um, they write uh, historical works. It seems to me, to me, creativity is essentially 
being a central component of life. I, I couldn't imagine living without it. Mm. So for me, it's it's a kind of it's a necessity, um, and I think that it is something that uh, to be able to do that at a professional level, uh, it gives back so much to other people. Mm. Uh, it's such a gift. Uh, I mean, experiences of being back in the Wigmore Hall after the pandemic, and, and you could see just the visible joy of both the performers and the audience of um, being able to listen to music performed in the present. Mm. Yeah, I totally agree. I remember there was a really yeah. lovely book um, that was um, that, that we, we, we partook in um, after COVID and it was like a string quartet concert that I was playing in and um, the, the, it was just the, the most sort of um, beautiful experience to sort of have uh, when we come back after uh, lockdown, um, just yeah. to sort of experience together. Um, did, you, did you have a question, Tommy? Yeah, um, this reminded me of um, a quote you brought up in a different interview, Sonu, um, where you mentioned, is it John Coltrane where he says, listen to one instrument at a time? Yeah. Um, and you applied that to reading as well. Yeah. So I was wondering if you could just give some advice on reading in the sense of, in, in that sense and getting the most out of it. Because um, again, it's a really, it's a lovely idea. It feels like it's yeah. together. I mean, the sense was like listening to a piece of music and just listening, just trace, if, if you're listening to a quartet, listen like four times, listening to just following one instrument and then listening to the whole thing as an ensemble. Um, reading a text following a certain line and just focusing on that line. A line of thought. Yeah, a line of thought, or even you could say a line of imagery. Looking at looking at the different elements um, and then just going back to reading it uh, as an ensemble. I mean, so for instance, with with Jung's red book, when I kind of um, what I recommend to people is you know, just read it, following through the fantasies. Don't ignore the second layer of commentary that he writes. To read it as it unfolds, read it in sequence. To just read through the fantasies in nineteen thirteen through to nineteen fourteen before he's written layer two of commentary. And then read the commentary. So we decompose the books into its elements, into the elements that he then actually, and the sequence in which he composed it. And when you follow that sequence, in a way historically, chronologically, then go back and read it as an ensemble to, real, to understand what he was trying to do by putting it together in that way. Mm -hmm. What well, I say to people, don't look at the images until you've really absorbed the text in the red book and they begin to open up when you've really immersed yourself in the text. Mm. Thank you. Would you, would you recommend then um, reading the text first and then <laughs> looking at absolutely. the images? Out? Absolutely, because that's, that's the sequence by which um, they emerge and in a certain sense he starts to, to paint when he can't express things in language. So he needs to he, you could say he needs to reach for another register. But in a way you, you need to sort of start with what he's been able to express in language before the next before he moves to the next level. Mm. Can you think of other books you've decomposed like that, that stand out in your mind? Um, not a text I've been as, um, spent so many years cooped up in. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. When we last spoke, you, you, were, you said that you regarded Jung as um, a, a cellmate. Um, yeah. is, 
Yeah, <laughs> you sort of spend so much time with his um, ideas that it's sort of, you know, you're, you're, you're sort of joined at the hip. <laughs> is, is, that, is that right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I think I think it'll be a lovely place to sort of um, draw things to a close. And, and um, so, thank thank you so much for um, yeah. so much for your time with us, and um, we really enjoyed your company. There's just one reference I'm going to add. It's just a it's a book that one of my PhD students uh, wrote. It would be of interest. Some of, the, some of the themes we touched on, I put it in the chat. Mm. So I'll just I'll read that out for people who are listening. Um, Music and Myth in modern uh, in, in modern literature by Josh Tarabi. Um, yeah, we'll definitely make sure to check that out. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right.